BBC podcast, Pressurized, a short, punchy version of our main feed that gets right to the scientific point. If you like what you hear and you'd like to hear the full episode, you can find it in the same feed. And now, to get right to the point. On this episode, we are going to talk about soundscapes today. So this guy is from Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He's a guy I had the pleasure of working with earlier this year, in part on the Mariana Trench. He is working in a fascinating subject. He's a fascinating guy, actually, both from a scientific perspective and a personal one. He's a guy who records the ambient soundscapes of the deep ocean. Also happens to be the host of another podcast called Sciographies, which where he interviews uh, other scientists from Dalhousie University. So without further ado... We shall welcome David Barclay to the Deep Sea Podcast. All right, and joining us today is David Barclay from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Hello, Dave. Hello. First of all, tell us a little bit about yourself and the kind of research that you are into. Well, I am here yeah, at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Yeah, and so my research in general, in a little bit of a nutshell, I would say I'm very interested in what we can learn just by listening. And in particular in the ocean, just so happens to be that's a little bit where the money is. But in general, I like to think about what you can extract from the environment Uh, you know, about the environment just by listening to sound. And one of the main focuses of that work has been looking in the deep ocean and in particular, the deep, deep ocean, the Hadal, the Hadal depths, which I believe is the subject of this very podcast. That kind of came out of the thin air when I um, went to grad school. So I, I, I went to grad school with this fellow, Mike Buckingham, to, to be my supervisor. One of his hallmark pieces of research was he basically built a, a system for imaging objects underwater just by listening. The throwaway statement is that uh, electromagnetism, uh, optical waves and RF and you know Wi-Fi and you name it, none of those electromagnetic waves travel well underwater. So we have, we as a, as a species have turned to um, acoustic waves to do all the remote sensing, things like seeing, you know, measuring distances, measuring content uh, of, of water. We do all those things using acoustics in, in the ocean. So he had done this totally passive device that was sort of like a acoustic eyeball and you put it underwater and it uses the sound at the surface of the ocean as sort of a blue sky. You can think of the the ocean as this infinite surface of breaking waves. And each one of those waves creates a little bit of sound. Each breaking wave from the other is sort of uncorrelated and random space and time. But in general, that's sort of like light passing through the atmosphere and scattering. So, you know, we get light directly from the sun that scatters off objects and we can see them. But we also get a lot of light that scatters off the atmosphere first, becomes that blue sky, then scatters off the object and sort of evenly illuminates them. And so in a way, the ocean is this analogous environment where there's no sun, but there's a lot, there's plenty of blue sky to illuminate objects. Anyways, he built this device. That's how I heard of him. That's how I said, I want to go work with him and really pursue this idea of what can we learn just by listening in the ocean. Now, the real world being what it is, um, we had to, you know, find some funding. And so reading through one of the funding agencies sort of call for proposals, there was just this little three word phrase there said one of the things they were interested in was deep ocean noise. And that kind of spurred the idea of making an autonomous lander to go uh, measure deep ocean noise as opposed to a very expensive, very elaborate, very difficult to deploy array system. So typically, acoustic measurements are made with a big series of train wheel anchors and a long, very thick cable with hydrophones attached to it at different spacings and then a big series of glass floats at the top. And it takes a huge vessel with a very nice A-frame crane to deploy the thing and someone very knowledgeable to, to get in the water safely and get it out again. And to the tune of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. So the idea was, let's try and build a system that's on the order of tens of thousands of dollars that can make the same type of measurement by moving through the water column. And that's that's exactly what I did in grad school. And so we built this system that was rated to nine kilometers. And the whole idea is that it would start at the surface of the ocean, descend uh, at a sort of slow pace with a series of hydrophones attached to it and sort of a configuration, a, a little mini array. And essentially, as it descends, you sort of record the changing properties of the sound field in the ocean. The main interest of why did the funding agency, which, by the way, is the Office of Naval Research. So there's sort of this part of its basic research, but there's also this applied, you know, sinister applied aspect to it. And so I'll paint, I'll paint <laughs> a little bit the, word, the use of the word sinister. In there. <laughs> well, you know, every, everything, everything humans do is a little bit sinister, I think, at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. So the reason why the U.S. Navy would be interested in this or why it's a defense application in general is it's all about the 
vertical structure of the ocean. So there's this sort of temperature profile that the deep sea has, there's a salinity profile, and there's a pressure profile. And all of those things combine to make a deep ocean sound speed profile. So why is that interesting? Well, in the deep ocean, at the surface, you have sort of hot, fresh water that has a fairly high sound speed. Then as you go down in depth, the sound speed decreases until about 1,200 meters, 1,500 meters, because the temperature is cooling off. So it gets colder and colder. The sound speed slows down, right? That's kind of easy to imagine, sort of a cartoon thermodynamics perspective, right? The molecules moving a little less. But then at about 1,500 meters, the pressure starts to take over. So the pressure is actually forcing the molecules together, making them communicate sound a little bit better. And as you go below 1,500 meters, the pressure starts to ramp the sound speed back up again. It gets higher and higher and higher. And it basically is linear. It just increases with depth at a linear rate beyond sort of 1,500 meters, 2,000 meters. The product of that is that at that, we call it the channel axis depth at about 1,500, 1,200 meters, there's a sound channel and it acts as a waveguide. And so because of refraction, acoustic waves get trapped at that depth or around that depth. Um, So they refract back towards that depth, whether above it or below it. And so it's the super efficient way to transmit sound around the world. And the famous experiments, there was this Heard Island experiment in the 90s, early 90s, where they blew up some dynamite in Heard Island in the Indian Ocean and recorded it all the way in the eastern seaboard and western seaboards of the United States. So you can really transmit sound around the world using the sound channel. But is this the, ch- the same channel that marine mammals use? Yes. Certainly the low frequency marine mammals like blue whales, you know, they dive down deep and shoot sound into this channel and you can hear them easily hundreds of kilometers, sometimes thousands of kilometers away. It's a really remarkable little bit of physics that yeah, humans and animals exploit alike. Now, to go deeper, what's the other sort of interesting region of the ocean? So I said that's, that, that sound speeds increases linearly with depth. So that causes sound to refract upwards below 1,500 meters. It sounds always refracting upwards. And so you can imagine, well, all the sound generated at the surface by, by ships and by storms and waves rainstorms, all of that sound is going to eventually refract back up towards the surface and never reach certain depths. So there's this idea of a critical depth, and it's usually around five or 6,000 meters, below which no sound at the surface can really penetrate. And the idea being if it's propagating at any angle other than straight down, it's going to refract back up and go back up towards the surface and never make it below that critical depth. That's interesting. And that's why the defense application comes into play. Oh, right. The because sinister element of it. <laughs> it's not just our acoustic releases failing. <laughs> it's not just the acoustic. Exactly, exactly. It's not just comms and acoustic releases, although that certainly is something that is very interesting. Um, but the idea is below this critical depth, it's very quiet, very, very quiet. And so if you're trying to detect a acoustic source, like a submarine or a ship, if you want to do some tracking of a, of a vessel, one way to do that is to increase your signal to noise ratio. And the easiest way is just to go below the critical depth where the noise power level decreases, thereby giving you the best chance of hearing something. So for example, if you wanted to listen to submarines coming out of the Navy base in Guam, the Mariana Trench would be a good place to It'd hide. It would be absolutely the perfect place to put your receiver. <laughs> oh, you okay. Would, yeah, yeah, you would get just the, the best quality detection. One of the things that we've measured that's been interesting is actually the noise power doesn't always decrease below the critical depth. When it's a windy day, and by windy, in like 10 knots, not really that windy for the middle of the ocean, there actually is so much noise that propagates directly downwards. So directly, you know, at 90 degrees or zero degrees, whatever you want to orient it directly straight down that doesn't get refracted. And actually, there's enough of that noise that the power remains constant below the critical depth. So that was kind of one of the, the interesting findings we've made. So to continue along the story a little bit, we made these measurements down to nine kilometers. We found some of these findings that were applicable to sort of understanding the vertical distribution of noise in the ocean. But I never actually got to land an instrument on the bottom of the Challenger Deep um, because I tried and it imploded at 8,500 meters. We've all had that happen. (laughs) This was kind of interesting because I had two systems in the water. So I lost one. Big disappointment. But the other one was recording. So we have a recording of an implosion at 8,500 meters. Do you want me to play that? I, I mean, I think you should, but you should warn everyone that is going to be extremely sudden and loud. It's, it's basically the audio equivalent of a jump scare.
<laughs> that sounded expensive. <laughs> and am I right in yeah. thinking we're hearing the echo there? It is a it is a single point implosion, and then that's it reverberating through the trench. Yeah, that's what's so cool about it is that um, not only do you hear the echo, but the echo is eleven seconds later. So it's like going into the most majestic, you know, natural cathedral of all time, and and clapping your hands, and you just have this. But there's like multiple echoes, yeah, you know, yeah. if you really listen closely. And the first arrival there, that sort of it's kind of a click, and then sort of a breaking glass sound. Really, that's the hydrophone itself just becomes so compressed and saturated that it can't record. You know, it just makes that click, and it's frozen in like total terror. And then you hear the rest of the sort of the decay there as it kind of recovers and starts relaxing again. I kind of describe the sound as breaking glass, but really what it is, is it's a giant bubble, right? Yeah. And then that bubble yeah. breaks into trillions, some, you know, in, infinite number of smaller bubbles and some cascading um, process. Uh, so it's just, yeah, it's just an amazing bit of audio, at least. So for those who have never thought about undersea soundscapes, and it's not something that we normally really think about, to be fair, what does the deep sea actually sound like on an average kind of day? What's this sort of ambient soundscape of it? It truly is noise in the way in the absence of any biological activity which in these regions i think uh, without some bait you're not going to hear much i don't think there's too much sound going on mm. when you get below that critical depth you're really just hearing the ocean above you and by the ocean i mean really mean this infinite sheet of perfectly flat ocean with these little flashes of sound coming from every little breaking spilling wave you know when you're out there they look so small but they're they actually generate a little, lot of sound every spilling bit of water contains these bubbles and the bubbles get injected into the ocean and they ring because of the sort of pressure instability that they have they vibrate and you can imagine each spilling wave there's again you know a huge number of bubbles and then there's a huge number of these waves and they're all random in space and time but sort of uniformly distributed in both it's almost like going to your television just turning it up turning the volume up all the way and just listening to that static you hear this accumulation of all these sources that have random phase arriving at your your ears and it just sounds like this static it truly is a a statistical noise, you know, in that sense. So uh, out of interest, some of the more violent aspects of the deep sea, say, for example, take a hydrothermal vent. Is that, mm -hmm. I mean, presumably that's really loud. Well, interesting, because <laughs> we've made two measurements on hydrothermal vents in the last year. So bubbles are very loud. There mm -hmm. are other mechanisms. So both of our recordings of hydrothermal vents, when you play them back, you don't hear the hydrothermal vent necessarily. So it's not loud enough to sort of stick out amongst the other noises that are going on around you. So that was a little bit surprising. I think if you were in the back arc basin, for instance, by the Mariana Trench, if you went sort of to the west there, to the shallow, you would hear bubbling vents. But um, at the particular event we went to, which was one was the Endeavor vent at the Wanda Fuca plate, and the other was the Stritan vent, which is in Iceland, which is the shallowest vent in the world. It's 15 meters from, from oh, the right. surface. So it's <laughs> the perfect place to do oceanography. Both of those, while they're not hot enough, I suppose, or they don't have the right thermodynamic conditions to create mm. bubbles. There's probably some chemistry involved in there too that I don't really know, but they don't, they don't have bubbles. So they're not really loud. They do, however, have really hot water. In the case of the Endeavor, it's like 300 degree water mixing with four degree water. And that itself is a process that does generate sound very inefficiently, but enough that you can hear it. And then you can also think about just the flow. You know, you have this high flow of fluid out of a long sort of organ pipe looking structure. You could imagine there's be standing waves in there. There could be vibrations from that that you can hear as well. All of those are like low frequency things. And the problem is when you get down to low frequency in this world, you start to deal with things like flow noise and, you know, ships and fin whales and other annoying things that get in the way. But certainly you can hear these things, but they're not as loud. Again, as Considering how much energy is there, in a way, not a lot of that is being lost to sound. I always just assumed it would be really noisy, just because it looks so violent. But I guess it you're right, so if violent, there's no yeah. bubbles in there, then maybe not. You expect a rumble. Yeah. We've yeah. been tricked again by these documentaries. It's the twinkly bioluminescence all over again. Yeah. And the thing is, so that there actually was a paper from maybe 10, 15 years ago where the first person w went to record sound in a hydrothermal vent and he put his hydrophone in the, in the flow of the vent and it melted off. And it's like, oh, it was wow. really, really noisy. It's like, of course it is because fluid was moving across the hydrophone, right? And so yeah. that's the same thing as taking your microphone and blowing into it. I don't know if you can hear that. I don't know if you guys follow the news. I think this is going to be a bit of a subtweet here. I think that's what they call this. But uh, if you guys follow the news and you saw that rover from Mars sent some sound back and the clip basically just sounds like someone blowing on their phone and then uh, a hard disk spinning. And they're like, this is amazing. This is what it sounds like on Mars. We've done it. And it's like, 
that's what it sounds like if you take a microphone on Mars and put it into the wind, right? It's not sound. You wouldn't hear that if you were there. Yeah, it's like putting a microphone out of the car window. That's right, exactly. <laughs> so I do get a little bit annoyed by these. The entertainment aspect of, of sound can be very misleading. You've come to the right place for that. <laughs> I think, that, I mean, it, it all started, you know, what's, uh, what's that Cousteau, Louis Mal movie from the 60s that won the Palme d'Or at Cannes Film Festival that everyone loves? Silence de la Mer, right? Silent yeah, yeah. Ocean or whatever, which is wholly untrue. Just not a thing. It's very noisy. We have the same challenge in the ocean, always trying to deal with flow noise, trying to deal with noise from our own system and, you know, electronic noise. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to do. It would be really interesting actually to do combination video, audio and baited trap. I do think in the, in the deep ocean, because I know these things definitely make noise when they're eating. Yeah. Um, and the question is, you know, do they use that sound to, you know, communicate with themselves to kind of flock together and, and I'm actually giving together. some data to, uh, I don't call it you, in YT and then we talk via Tim because we had his hydrophone on the lander at the same time we were filming probably the Mariana, I think. And yeah, you have these huge big swarms of amphipods that come along and just destroy the bait for about six hours. And they mm -hmm. will increase in numbers very, very quickly. And then as the bait goes, they die down very quickly. So you should theoretically see a noise level follow that yeah. follow that pattern. And then but when the fish come, the big cuscules, they tend to come much later on and they very gradually build in numbers to the very end. So you should mm -hmm. theoretically be able to pick out two frequencies that marry up to that. So that's something we're going to look into. And then I think Tom knows more about this, but I think the Cuskills say the males or females have drumming muscles. Oh, neat. I'm desperate to record sound at one of our landers because I'm pretty sure a lot of the behavioral stuff is coordinated with sound. So yeah, the, the males, they both have drumming muscles. They're bigger in the males. So the males mm. will probably almost sing and advertise their presence. And then the yeah. females will be attracted to that, but they still can communicate as well. So I think there'll be, there'll have to be a sort of timing of gamete release, essentially. They'll have to be coordinating the mating. And I think they'll use sound for that. But um, they would do that all the time though. I don't know. I don't know at all. Some of these fish, if they only spawn once every 50 years, maybe the chances, the chances of recording it might be quite slim. <laughs> I would like to leave quite a big food fall because I reckon, you know, you're a grenadier or a cuscule or something like that. You find like a whale fall, something that's going to be a habitat essentially that's going to last for a few years. Yeah. I think in terms of your energy budget, you hang around and you reproduce then. So I think, yeah, makes sense. I think it might end up being a bit of a last days of Rome big feast and an orgy going on at the same time. Bit of a drum and drum and bass evening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> drop the bass. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah I, I'm, I'm fascinated in this and I'm, I'm adamant that a lot of these animals are, are quite noisy but it, probably in their own subtle up close ways yeah and it's hard to tell I mean these experiments are really difficult to tell if they're using the noise to communicate because there's competing factors like we did one in, in San Diego Bay there's seahorses there mm -hmm. and they make really loud noise they snap their jaws open and essentially cavitates and when they suck in the little pellets of food, whatever they're eating. Uh, San Diego Bay itself is really, really muddy. So they can't see. They certainly are not using their eyes to see each other feeding. Are they using sound? So we actually did an experiment that went nowhere <laughs> in the uh, Scripps Aquarium when I was a student there. And we built a maze and we put a recording of a, of a seahorse eating at one end of the maze and then the seahorse at the other to see if it would like navigate the maze to find its buddy eating and it didn't at all just uh, oh, worth a shot. hung out <laughs> in a corner and just yeah i was like ah oh, probably makes sense they probably use smell but i, I imagine the deep ocean is a lot different because it just is a different scale right i mean it's massive down there and it's so sparse and the food has to be pretty scarce there's even a paper isn't there alan hypothesizing that the amphipods hear the feeding frenzy and are drawn in by that yeah it's one from the 70s someone had calculated that there are a bunch of Abyssal amphipods, I think with Eurythenes or something, when they start feeding, they should theoretically be able to hear that a kilometre away. Very cool. And the snailfish's pharyngeal jaws as well. I'm sure they'll be making a crunching, grinding noise as they're munching on all those pods. Well, that was something we should look into. Yeah, yeah there's still lots to learn. <laughs> Good. Given that we're on a podcast and we're speaking to someone who's got lots of interesting audio files, I think we should have a game of what the hell is that? I guess, Tom, just play number one and see what happens. I know what that is. Sounds like a train going past. It sounds like multiple trains. I think that's a vessel. I think I can hear the engine, but I can hear something else in there as well. Yeah. But maybe not. Maybe not. It's pinger or ultrasound. Maybe something. Maybe something else running. You're spot on. It's it's definitely a vessel. It's a big vessel, and so all of this turning machinery, right? Like some of the generators are just 
creating electricity to power the TV that's in the lounge or whatever. All of this machinery turns at different speeds. There's gearboxes that sort of relate it all together. And that vessel is like 50 kilometers away or something like that. It's, it's quite far away. Yeah. I'm seeing the military merit now because you could yeah. probably figure out what that vessel was, what it was capable of. They've got three of their four generators on. So they're up to something yeah. rather than just passively moving along. Absolutely. And you, you can hear how fast it's going. You can hear the captain fart. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> Ha. I know oh, you. I know what that is. <laughs> Did it not reply? One way call. Uh, that yeah. is the acoustic modem on the limiting factor. That, that's correct. That is a modem. And part of that clip that's really interesting, it is interesting to hear the modem because it reminds you of trying to log into the internet in 1992. Mm -hmm. Also, because you can also hear the reverb there, right? You can hear how reverberant that space is when you hear that signal. And I, I do love that. It feels oh, familiar, like is this uh, ice this cracking. Going to freak you out. Close. Glass cracking. It's glass cracking. That's correct. Is this going to get expensive? That's what it feels like. Well, <laughs> is it the sphere it, is rubbing? It's it's the sphere itself. So the instrument is built out of this two hemispheres put together, right? And that's all the electronics inside. And so sphere is great because every spot on the sphere has an equal amount of pressure and it's supported by every adjacent spot that has the same amount of pressure. So it compresses totally evenly, right? Except at the damn interface where the two hemispheres meet, right? This is quite triggering to us. This is <laughs> that is a sound that uh Oh, now I've got a few spheres in my time. I've got a yeah. soundtrack to my anxiety now when we're looking for That's those right. little glass shavings in the bottom of the spheres. That's what you're hearing there is the formation of those little glass shavings off the inner lip of the hemisphere. Right, go on, Tom. Maybe beyond our hearing. It sounds like somebody's in the shower. I'll spare you the, the guessing. This is the actual recording from the bottom of the Challenger Deep just sitting there. Oh. It's a recording of silence. Of course, it's not totally silent. And there's always this ambiguity of how loud something is, right? Mm -hmm. So we send a microphone down there, we record it, we bring it back, and then you want to listen to it. Well, you have a volume on your stereo, right? So right away, you're going to apply some gain there, or do you normalize the file, or then you're playing it back over this podcast. So that the idea of volume is always a little bit suspect. And if you want to listen to an actual calibrated how loud it would actually be to actually have your ears down there, it gets a bit complicated. But in general, it's interesting to hear sort of the timbre of the sounds at a listenable volume. Mm. So that's essentially what we are hearing there is just the silence at the bottom of the Challenger Deep. Of course, not totally silent. You can hear all sorts of breaking waves from the surface. And maybe if you listen long enough, there's maybe other things to hear. You know, that's sort of the, the quintessential... Ambience. Yes, exactly. I thought it was amazing you can hear the waves lapping on the surface at 11,000 meters underwater. I still find that mind-blowing. So if there's a big storm, you know, if it's a big force eight blowing at the top, that must be quite loud then. It gets louder. And I think we should maybe play a related clip next. Now, this is not from the Challenger Deep. This is from the Philippine Sea. But again, below that critical depth, quite deep. And there's a change to it. So do you hear sort of the quality of sound is a little bit different? Yep. That's because there's just exactly that. There's like a rainstorm, one of these, you know, mid-Pacific warm rainstorms just pelting down on the surface. So you're really hearing, again, an uncountable number of raindrops hitting the ocean surface, creating a little bubble, making that smack, making a bubble that resonates. And since the raindrops have a characteristic size, there's a characteristic frequency that gets brought out. It's a little bit brighter um, sound than you would hear from waves, which sort of have a larger bubble, lower frequency sound to them. This could be a surface recording. This is great. Is there anything you've ever recorded that you just have no idea where it was? I do have some recordings where I, I don't really know what it is. And I have a lot of other people's recordings where we've tried to sit down to figure out. It can be quite challenging. And that's one of the reasons like why our, our system, for instance, we have multiple hydrophones to try and do some of that coherent processing where you can look at the direction it's coming from. You, you can look at its spatial correlation and try and get some understanding of how big the thing was and you know where it was. I can actually maybe retaliate in your career, David, if you come across the bloop. It's something we covered on a previous episode. I have heard the bloop, yeah. We sort of asked a few experts at the time, but what is your interpretation? I don't want to spoil the fun, but I think they solved the bloop. Oh, yeah, it's totally done. But people ignore they, that because it's not the fun. Bloop. 
Okay. <laughs> ice calving, iceberg related sound. Yeah. It's ice crashing about. Yeah. Everyone hears it in its sped up, pitched up version. And if you listen to the... That's right. Again, the entertainment industry just ruining it for the rest of us. Well, David, that's been fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. I really appreciate uh, the interest. And that was a pressurized version of one of our longer episodes. If you enjoyed that and you would like to hear the full length episode, just match the episode numbers and you'll be able to find the full length version in the feed. Thanks for listening. We'll deep see you next time. And I abyss you already. On the ride with the